Um, hello, uh, good morning, everyone, and well, thank you very much, uh, Nikita and uh, Pijo, uh, Fabian, for this great initiative. Let's see, uh, can you see? Yes. Okay. So yeah, for this great initiative, and, and especially now for this uh, first meeting uh, for users, I am very happy to participate and to show to share our updates on the lab and the help of, the, of our lab uh, on our last advances on tissue pairing and, and the computational tools to analyze those images coming out from the microscope. Uh, can you see the full screen and print in this? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. So, well, just starting from the beginning. So we are, uh, in biology, we are interested on, on processes that, is, that uh, range from uh, many different uh, scale, uh, uh, spatial scales. So processes that go from a few Armstrongs up to many meters, let's say. But most of the physiological processes in which we are interested can be studied from a mesoscale uh, perspective, right? So this would be the range in between a few microns up to a few centimeters that we are interested in. And uh, the development of mesoscale imaging, it was, it's not only a, a single uh, field that uh, comes uh, by the hand of, uh, of microscopy, but it also requires the developments in other parallel uh, fields, like in this case, uh, merging uh, the development of light sheet microscopes, uh, tissue engineering with tissue clearing, the development of uh, molecular tools for tissue labeling, and the development of, uh, of uh, software and hardware solutions for, for image uh, analysis, right? These four fields uh, have converged and uh, were greatly developed in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, as we just saw in the number of publications related on the topic. And now we are, I, I think, in the gold moment, in the gold age of uh, mass scale imaging. So in our team, we work a lot on on mostly uh, developing tools for uh, the analysis of these images and uh, the optimization of tissue clearing uh, methods for, for the staining. So is what am I going to speak more today? Uh, so on the side of tissue clearing, uh, well, if we think about it with a, pers with a historical perspective, we can uh, already see that uh, in biology, most of the seminal discoveries were made with uh, model organisms that were either transparent or, uh, along their uh, life cycle or transparent during their development. However, they reach a point in their in their lives that they are not uh, transparent anymore. And there are many animals, many model organisms that are never transparent. So this has been a limitation uh, to expand uh, the research uh, beyond those uh, animal models. And uh, it was early in the 20th century that uh, the first uh, clearing protocols were developed to actually turn transparent those uh, species that were not uh, transparent anymore. So the first, um, uh, protocol that was um, broadly used uh, was the Spadelkov uh, one, that is the basis of any uh, organic solvent uh, method uh, of the ones that are used uh, now. Uh, but we can see that actually from that first pro uh, protocol, we have now a super wide uh, number of protocols that uh, developed mostly in the last uh, yeah, 10 years. Some of them are still organic solvent based uh, methods. Many others are uh, aqueous methods. I'm sure you will hear later about them. Uh, in our team, we work with the uh, ones uh, that are organic solvent methods. Uh, however, all of them uh, rely on the same um, principle. So in biological samples, we always have a mixture of uh, biomolecules that have different uh, refractive indexes. So this mixture of uh, indexes makes that the, the path light, the light path 
uh, gets uh, disrupted and, and the light is scattered on the samples. Also biological samples contain uh, pigments. So part of the light, light is going to be absorbed by them. So with tissue clearing, with any protocol of tissue clearing, what we want to do is to restore the, the, light, uh, the path light, uh, the light path across the samples. And this we uh, do it by removing part of the biomolecules of the sample and uh, shrinking the, the heterogeneity of the refractive index uh, mix uh, to narrow it uh, around a, a more uh, like a precise uh, range, right? So this is an example of uh, how it works for organic solvent uh, based methods in which we often do a dehydration step. So we remove all the water which has a low refractive index. Then we re uh, remove uh, lipids that have a very high refractive index. We remove uh, bonds. So have also very high refractive index. We bleach the pigments so we don't have uh, so much absorption of light. And when then the final step is to add a, uh, uh, an immersion method, uh, um, substance uh, that will match the refractive index of the remaining components on the sample. In this case, it's going to be a, an organic solvent that will have a refractive index above uh, 1.5. So we have, um, again, a, a broader number of uh, cl tissue clearing methods nowadays, and uh, there is none of them that is perfect for every application. Some of them are very good at preserving endogenous uh, fluorescence in the samples, while others are better for scatter-free imaging. That's the case for iDisco, which is the, the tissue clearing method that we used in the lab. It was developed by, by Nicola. Uh, uh, during his postdoc, and it's a quite simple method uh, in which we first do a, a pretreatment of the sample uh, for dehydration and the lipidation. So we do it with methanol and dichloromethane. Uh, we do a permeabilization with a uh, triton, and then we do an immune staining the uh, in aqueous uh, conditions, obviously. And finally, uh, the optical clearing um, step that is very short in this protocol, it might take in between uh, two and three days for an adult mouse brain to become transparent, which consists in a full dehydration in methanol, again, and refractive index matching with uh, DVE. Uh, so the advantage of this method uh, is that it produces very, uh, scatter-free uh, samples. So it provides good uh, transparency, but it doesn't pres preserve the endogenous uh, fluorescence. So we always need to do an immune staining to detect the signal we want to see. And for this, we use two strategies. We either uh, combine primary and secondary antibodies um, when the antigen is very sparse or lowly, uh, has low levels of expression, or we use uh, uh, conjugated primary antibodies when the antigen that we study is very dense, because in those cases we see that the secondary uh, antibodies don't diffuse well and we don't get a good staining. So uh, using one or the other strategy, it provides uh, really good results uh, in iDisc for, for the visualization of any structure. And uh, well, here is an overview of uh, how the samples look after the IDISC protocol. We mostly use it for adult brain uh, tissue, but works well also in, in during development for the brain. And in mouse embryos, we use it up to E15. And uh, yeah, that's mostly the applications we do. So now I'm going to go through the computational uh, tools that we developed in the, in the lab. Uh, by using uh, my main project uh, as a guide, let's say. So I'm, in, I'm studying the uh, structural plasticity in the adult brain. And for this, I use a model of sensory loss. So you might be familiar with the concept of, uh, with the concept of, uh, of neuronal plasticity. So during development, um, let's say, um, most of the connectivity of the brain is set by is determined by genetic uh, 
uh, factors. So it's uh, it's really reproducibly, uh, uh, reprodu well, it's really stable across uh, individuals. However, there is a, a, a period uh, across, uh, around the perinatal um, moment in which uh, the connectivity of the brain is refined ba uh, in base of the uh, experience. So this step uh, provides the perfect matching in between the organism and the environment, right? It uh, uh, fine tunes the connectivity of the, of the neurons. Uh, and it's known that the modifications to the sensory experience during these critical periods uh, um, cause permanent uh, changes in the patterns of connectivity of the brain. Uh, once this, uh, the connectivity is uh, optimized during development, then it's considered to be stable uh, across the adulthood. However, there are some studies that show the opposite, well, that show evidences of uh, some sort of uh, remodeling of the connectivity in the adulthood. And that's what I'm interested in. And for this, I'm using the somatosensory system, system which is a very well-known uh, system. It's uh, very convenient because it's very accessible for manipulation, and in principle, it's uh, simple. Uh, but it has the advantage that it can potentially uh, affect the entire brain because the, the network is quite complex. So, uh, as I said, I'm interested on in studying uh, adult plasticity in the somatosensory system. And for this, what we do is to challenge the system. So we do a sensory deprivation in the adult life. Uh, for this, we do a, a surgical ablation of the myostasial pad, of the whisker pad. And this is the first uh, uh, results we got. It's uh, just the visualization of the, of the surgery. So this is also a disco uh, clearing, tissue clearing is the adult uh, snout of, uh, an adult of a mouse. And you can see the infraorbital branch of the trigeminal nerve reaching the whisker pad in the left panel on the control and innervating the, the whisker follicles. While in the operated mice, we don't have the structure of the follicles anymore and they are removed, but we keep the innervation of the skin. So uh, this is the model and uh, we studied the three main features. So how does this deprivation uh, affect to neuronal activity, uh, the vascular topology and the connectivity of the system? And we, uh, I'm going to go through them. So I, I show you the computational tools that we use for every example. So for neuronal activity, uh, we are using ClearMap, which it was developed also by Nicola and, and collaborators uh, a few years ago. It's a script to reconstruct uh, light sheet images by doing a stitching and then uh, detect uh, cells in all the, in the entire uh, adult brain. Then uh, it uh, has a model for the alignment with a reference atlas. In this case, we use the Allen Brain Atlas. And then those individual results for every animal can be merged and uh, create average uh, heat maps and p-value maps in which we can compare experimental conditions. Uh, this is how clear map used to look like because it's a, a Python script. Uh, I just want to show here that uh, Charlie Rousseau in our lab is working on the development of a um, graphical user interface. So it's more amenable for any user, even if you don't have experience on coding. Uh, it's a beta version, let's say, uh, that is still in development, but you can already uh, get it in, in GitHub and start trying it and even like send a um, feedback for improvement and so so with this new tool you can easily uh, display the data do the cell de cell detection in the entire brain and uh, and even run the analysis so when we run a cell map on the animals that were subjected uh, like were deprived uh, uh, to the whiskers in the adult life what we see it's a, a, a great reduction on the on the neuronal activity, on the 
primary somatosensory cortex two days after the, the deprivation. And uh, what was surprising, because uh, we are doing a permanent deprivation, so the whiskers are not coming back, was that three weeks after this deprivation, we see a recovery on activity. However, if we look uh, further on at a long time, uh, at a longer uh, time point, at five months, we see that the activity recovery was a bit uh, uh, temporary or uh, yeah, partial. And we actually, five months after the deprivation, we see again hypoactivity in the region. If we look more in detail to these results, um, you can see that uh, after two days after the privation, the hypoactivity of the of the primary somatosensory region in the snout and the barrel field uh, region it's quite accentuated. While at three weeks we see a recovery, and actually what was uh, surprising for us was to see that the contralateral uh, barrel field was actually hyper excited, which would point to maybe the existence of. Um, homeostatic plasticity that would take over to, to rebalance the system. If we um, do a dual side, dual bilateral deprivation to, to go check if, if this hypothesis that the contralateral side is taking over, we, what we actually see is that the, the activity is not uh, recovered anymore in, the, in this region, in the barrel field. So it seems that uh, there is a temporary takeover from the contralateral hemisphere. However, as I mentioned before, when we go longer on the on time and we wait five months to, to see how activity uh, is distributed in the brain, we see that actually the, the viral field uh, come, comes back to be hypoactive. And it's also a bit hypoactive in the in the non-deprived uh, uh, cortex, mostly in the upper layers that would be the ones receiving the main uh, input from the deprived uh, cortex. Uh, so on other side, also in our lab, we work with the development, sorry, of uh, tools for the analysis of the vascular topology. And we studied it in this system. So just as an introduction to the, to the tool, uh, it's called the uh, tube map. It was published uh, now two years ago. Um, and it's, it follows a little bit the same, uh, the same um, uh, pipeline than cell map. But here, after doing the reconstruction of the image, the stitching, we don't do uh, uh, an array of uh, cell detection, but we build a graph that uh, contains the, topo the topology of the the entire uh, microvascular network of the brain. Then we do also the alignment of this graph and we can run a statistics on this. So uh, one of the novelties of this uh, version of clear map is that it includes a new uh, stitcher that is called the wobbly stitcher, which is a non rigid uh, en enables non rigid alignments of the of the tiles in set. So we can align every individual uh, set plane to remove any uh, duplications that could be coming uh, from uh, movements on the stage during the acquisition of, of a single set uh, stack. Uh, for the analysis of the vasculature, we also optimized the, the clearing and the staining method. So we found a combination of antibodies that worked uh, well to identify what was an artery, what was a vein, what was a capillary. We combine ACTA2 as a marker for large arteries and arterioles, and then a podocalyxin and CD31 as a general marker for all the capillary network and for the big veins. Uh, so the overview of tube map uh, is what you can see here. It contains a, a set of parametric uh, filters to, um, to first uh, process the raw image that comes from the, uh, from the light sheet that, as you know, it might con contain uh, artifacts uh, due to the illumination or shadows and this. So uh, we first uh, process, com uh, correct the images, and then we, once we have uh, the binary mask for the, for the data, 
we need to uh, fill the, the hollow tube. So from the binary, what we get is, um, is a network of uh, empty cubes because uh, the immune staining strategy that, you, that we use stains the wall of the, of the vessels. And then we need to fill those tubes to be able to further uh, build a skeleton on the network. So this we do with a DNN. Then we do a central line extraction by erosion of the, of the solid tubes. And this skeleton is used to, to build a graph. This graph contains uh, the information of every, um, in every edge of the radius, the density of the, of the markers and the capillary network, uh, the branching points, the annotation on the, on the atlas, and a bit anything you can, uh, you can imagine. So here you have a, a, a view of how the final graph, the reconstruction of the vasculature looks like. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I was here. So uh, we go from an initial image of, of the light sheet that is uh, two channels, one for the microvasculature and the other for the arteries, which are uh, above 400 gigabytes of data. And we uh, come down to a row graph that contains uh, 90 millions of uh, vessel segments. Uh, this means we have uh, at the end a graph that is a few gigabytes inside, in size and uh, contains all the information about these 320 meters of uh, vessels for a, for a mouse brain uh, with more than 3 million of uh, branching points. So it's very condensed uh, information. Uh, so as I mentioned before, once we have the graph, we can align, align it and make a statistics. And this is what I did also for, the, for this model of uh, sensory deprivation in the adult food. And uh, was surprising because we were expecting that after having a deprivation and seeing an hypoactivity in, a, in the primary somatosensory areas, we would uh, be seeing maybe uh, changes in the in the capillary network that would go uh, on the direction of removing vessels because maybe the metabolic demands of the region would be lower. But actually, what we see is the opposite. We see an increase of the density of the capillary networks in in these uh, affected regions. We have to look more in detail uh, if this could be related to other remodeling processes, but here we have the results. And so the final uh, features that we are analyzing in the lab is uh, it's neuronal connectivity. So uh, we first uh, started uh, by designing a, an unbiased method to look for just uh, broad uh, changes in connectivity in the, at the entire brain scale. So we are using uh, uh, phosphorylated neurofilament H as a marker. It's super dense. It uh, is not um, maybe the best marker for all brain regions, but for the somatosensory system, uh, we find it useful. And what we do is to uh, actually adapt the, the binarization steps from TubeMap that I previously uh, used to segment all the signal in the entire brain. And what we got is actually that there are actually changes in the long term. This is five months after the sensory deprivation. And what we see is a reduction on the levels of phosphorylated uh, neurofilament H in the sensory system. Actually, it's not uh, shown here, but it's also in other present in other regions in, in the subcortical relays like the VPM and also in auditory regions like the inferior colliculus that are affected. And uh, what we found uh, surprising and very interesting is an increase of, uh, of, of this um, phosphorylation of the, phosphor of the neurofilament age in the secondary somatosensory cortex. So we want to look more in detail to these changes, we want to see if uh, these uh, changes in activity in, this, in the barrel field, in the somatosensory cortex, 
changes in the vasculature and now that we see that there would be maybe changes in the connectivity could be detected by uh, explicitly looking at the connectivity of the viral field. For this, we are using uh, viral um, tracers. And here I'm going just to go briefly on one of the strategies we are using, which is combining anterograde and retrograde uh, uh, tracers in a single injection in the viral field. And uh, for here, it was the same. We needed to develop the bioinformatical tools to segment the data. So uh, once again, we took advantage of, uh, of uh, the frame of tube map to adapt the filters and segment axons. So here you have an example of how the raw data looks like in a viral injection, how the binary and the overlap look like. It's not perfect, we are working on it, but uh, it's promising. This is a, a movie that shows the same, sorry. We should first. probably gently wrap up if you don't have that many more slides. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry? Uh, so uh, we uh, we don't have uh, much time left uh, yeah. for this. Okay, slot. I'm done. I, it's just, okay. uh, mm -hmm. this is the final, this is just the, to show how the final graph looks like. Uh, as I said, it's not perfect. We are working on it, but uh, here we have the segmentation of viral injections. And so far, we don't see uh, big changes in long range connectivity uh, after the sensory deprivation, but we start to see something on the on the casual projections in between one viral field and the other. Uh, and well, this is all. Yeah, I just want to thank the, the team. Uh, especially Nicola, who uh, is our mentor. He really developed uh, most of these uh, tools together with uh, Christoph, uh, Charlie, Sophie, uh, Elisa, and, and well, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this beautiful talk. Are there any questions? Maybe I can start with one. Um, do you uh, plan any integration of cell map uh, or tube map with Napari um, as a plugin so that uh, there would be a larger community who could use it? So, so far, up to what I know, not. In principle, it's uh, now the short term uh, goal is to create the interface and start to launch it as a, a single thing, let's say, like uh, all integrated, then in the future it could be, uh, yeah. We have a question from uh, Etsuo Sosaki. Uh, Etsuo, please. Hello, uh, thank you for the nice talk. And I'm wondering um, how long did it take to stain the, the phosphoneurofilament under the body uh, of the entire brain? So basically, it's uh, you know, very hard to be penetrated, I guess so. Yeah, no, actually, we do the same uh, incubation time than for any other uh, antigen. Uh, we This is a conjugated antibody, so it's a shorter protocol. So usually it's five days of pretreatment, uh, 10 days I do for an adult uh, mouse brain of staining, and then the clearing is two days. So that's all. I see. Thank you. So we maybe have for, uh, time for one a more quick question. Uh, Ekaterina Petrova, please. Um, Alba, thank you very much for a beautiful talk. And my question is, have you ever tried staining vasculature before the cleaning, for example, with IV injection of some vasculature markers? Does it survive the cleaning? Uh, yeah, so we don't do uh, intravascular um, uh, uh, labeling here. Uh, it should uh, be compatible. Uh, we before doing the the vascular staining, like uh, uh, targeting the the vessel wall, we were doing IgG uh, immunostaining. So to actually uh, uh, get a staining that was solid that would uh, uh, stain the content of the of the vasculature. And the problem of this type of methods, both for the vessel filling dyes and for the detection of IgGs, is that 
are fragile uh, in terms of dissection that uh, you might have some leakage of the content of the of the vessels and then when you do the the staining is not uh, is not robust anymore uh, so in terms of uh, compatibility I, I think it should be compatible with uh, idisco but then in terms of reliability, I, I wouldn't uh, go for that strategy. Thank you. 